As Liverpool's first team get ready for their European showdown with Atletico Madrid, the academy have also been in European action for both the under-23s and under-19s. The under-19s already out, the 23s with a game to come. That plus the departure, of course, of Neil Critchley from the under-23s to Blackpool to come on this week's edition of the Academy Show here on the Blood Red Channel, courtesy of the Liverpool Echo. I'm Guy Clark, alongside me, Matt Addison. And Matt, since we were last sat in the chairs talking Talking all things academy, there's been a fair bit of change, hasn't there? There certainly has. It came out of the blue, of course, Neil Critchley's departure, as I'm sure everyone will be aware of by now. But yeah, a, a huge change for the academy and, and someone that's been here, I think, seven years, eight years now and has made a massive impact on so many of these young players that we've seen coming through the system. And I think you could tell really straight away from the reaction from everyone, from journalists to fans to the players who, who've been coached by Neil Critchley, just how well loved he was and, and how much he'll be missed. Yeah, there were a few names in the frame for the Blackpool job, Incident, coincidentally, one of those being Carl Robinson. And we're going to have a bit of chat about Oxford coming up shortly. But Blackpool obviously wanted a coach who was involved in the development phase of players. Carl Robinson, obviously previously himself, having been an academy coach at Liverpool. Great opportunity, though, for Neil Critchley. And after being at Liverpool for a good period of time now, working with the 23s, I suppose for him, it, it's a brilliant chance that it, I suppose he's not always too sure will come back round again to get involved in first-team football. Yeah, I think he's probably got a taste for it, obviously having been in the dugout for, for Liverpool's first team a couple of times this season. And look, when a, a club as big as Blackpool and you know, a, a League One outfit doing really, really well this season comes in for you. You've, you know, it, it's such a, a huge opportunity that whether there was any chance of him turning that down, I'm not too sure. But uh, it, it's going to be interesting to to see how he gets on. Obviously, first game on Saturday, uh, drew nil nil with Fleetwood Town, which is a, a fairly solid start, and I'm sure he'll want to to build on that and get better and better. But yeah, but obviously, everyone involved with Liverpool, everyone who knows him. And, uh, and has engaged with him over the past few years, wishes him all the best. And yeah, I'm sure uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to speak to him at some point before the end of the season to sort of catch up and, and have a word with him about how it's going. And But yeah, look, everyone wishes him well and he'll be a, a big miss at the club. But I think the club is, is generally quite happy for him to have got that opportunity. It shows that the job that he was doing was, was fantastic. Yeah, it shows that Liverpool aren't just producing players, they're producing coaches as, as well. In that first game, a nil-nil with Fleetwood Town, somewhat of a, a local derby match on the Fylde Coast at Highbury Stadium for Neil Critchley to get started. And I, I think one of the things that he's going to have to get used to as well, most definitely different to what he was doing with the under-23s, is working with experienced players. Because when you get to League One, even you look at the Blackpool team sheet, there's a few names that you sort of see leap off the page and think, Crikey, I remember him. Yeah, uh, not not least Jay Spearing, of course, a, a former Liverpool Academy prospect and indeed first team player for a couple of seasons. And yeah, he was on the bench for, for Neil Critchley yesterday and I'm sure he's one that I'm sure that the pair have come across each other many a time in the past through Liverpool connections. And I'm sure both of them will, will be able to work together really well. And Nathan Delfonso as well up front for, for Blackpool, former Aston Villa uh, youth prospect and then went on to play for their first team. So you know, even though he's he's dropped, well, dropped down a couple of leagues, probably not the right phrase given it's his first job, but, you know, even at that level, there's still a number of familiar faces and, look, there's a, a big job to be done there, but I'm sure everything that, that I know of him and the people around him and, and everyone that's sort of spoken to him over the past few years is, is very confident that he can go there and do the job that is required. And Blackpool aside, who aren't going to be going down this year, aren't going to be pulled into a relegation battle, they're not going to get into the promotion shake-up in League One, which does seem to pretty much engulf half of the table almost. And we got more on that very shortly. But in terms of Neil Critchley, this job, it gives him chance for perhaps the last quarter of the season to go in, assess the picture at Blackpool. And who knows, this time next season, we might be talking about a couple of lads from the under-23s going and getting their first taste of first-team football on the seaside. Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, a similar situation almost to, to Kumi Minamino coming in at, at, in January for Liverpool's first team. If both of them can settle in and then get really push ahead from the start of next season, I think it's going to be a real important pre-season for, for Neil Critchley to, to settle into his, his new role there and, and really bed his ideas in and, and what he wants to do. He's very clear about the way he wants to play the game and, and obviously much of that is, is tinged with, with elements that Jurgen Klopp and, and Liverpool have produced over the last couple of seasons. But 
he's very much his own man as well and he'll have his ideas and the way that he wants to, to stamp his authority on that team. It's going to be really interesting to, to see how he gets on and look, it would be no surprise if, if one or two of the players that we're going to be talking about throughout this podcast is, is going to be potentially moving to Blackpool next season and to be honest, that's probably one of the big reasons for, for them going after Neil Critchley is it's not just the, the coaching and the managerial skills that he provides, but also that connection to, to Liverpool and the sort of talent pool that, that he can potentially draw across from, from next season onwards. Yeah, definitely. We've seen Liverpool loaning players to League One this season. And one of those players is Ben Woodburn. And time now to talk about the Wales International because the 20-year-old's not played since October for Carl Robinson's Oxford United due to injury, having broken bones in both his right and left foot. But this week, as he builds up towards a comeback, Matt has been catching up with David Pritchard of the Oxford Mail on the frustrations that Woodburn has faced. I mean, it's been five long months for, for him and Oxford with him on the sidelines. So he, he, uh, it was a real shame, actually, because he was just starting to show what he could do. And the start of October he was on the receiving end of a forceful tackle, shall we say, uh, in the game at Ackbees and Stanley, uh, which saw him break a bone in his f- foot. I think it was his left foot. Um, that involved an operation and a layoff of about 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, he was due back in the squad just before Christmas, but uh, in one of his final training sessions with Liverpool before they sort of released him back, he suffered basically an identical injury in his other foot, um, which is so a real big blow. Um, so, you know, here we are, you know, another, what, 10, 12 weeks later, and now, now finally he's um, he's due back again. So it's been a bit of a, a, a bizarre one um, for him, but uh, hopefully that's all now behind him. Just looking a little bit further ahead to next season, how likely yeah. do you think it is that he comes back to Oxford next season? I know it's something that um, Carl Robinson, the head coach, who obviously um, started his career as, a, as an academy coach for Liverpool, it's something he has mentioned in terms of he would love to, to do a deal to, to get him back again. Uh, obviously, if they were to get promoted, that would certainly help things along. Um, but Carl has this, has this way of... Uh, kind of engendering loyalty with players who've played under him and and it might just be a case of you kind of almost go to Ben look, look let's let's hit the reset button it's, it's 12 months we should sort of move on from and, and come in and have the season next season that we hoped you'd have this time around I mean like you say he's only 20 he's got time um, I guess that you know ultimately it depends on what Liverpool's plans are with him, but uh, Oxford would certainly be keen to to do a deal, and I know he was Carl was sort of has been talking about that for several months. So I think it, it has been brought up. I just I, it probably hasn't been a decision probably hasn't been made at this point. But um, yeah, Oxford would definitely be keen, and, and it would be really interesting to see how he would do with a you know a full on season. And I think he could really be a, a standout player at this level. Yeah, a, a former Liverpool Academy coach as well, as you mentioned, and uh, yeah. a former Liverpool Academy prospect, uh, Cameron Brannigan, has, has been down at Oxford now for a, a couple of years. Can you uh, bring us up to date as to sort of how he's getting on and, and how well he's mm. settled down there? Yeah, I mean, he's kind of one-off uh, a production line that United have tried over the last few years and won one um, kind of pretty good source of material has been players who haven't quite made the grade at Premier League clubs and actually they, they had a really productive uh, link with with Everton for a long time and John Lundstrom was the uh, probably the best example of that who kind of off they've off, they've been able to offer these guys regular football um, and uh, Lundstrom certainly you know then went from there to Sheffield United and now he's doing very well in the in the Premier League. So Brannigan uh, came in with yeah pretty big reputation. It, it took him a little while to settle, but uh, he's a really, really key player for Oxford. Um, he's probably got 100 odd games under his belt in the last couple of years, uh, and that is exactly what he came here to do. You know, he is someone who who really he loves playing football. He's he's one of these guys who, who you know you wouldn't be surprised to hear of him playing in a Sunday team or whatever just because he um, he just wants to play. Uh, so yes, he's a very key player. He's had a little bit of issue with a with a knee problem this this season. Otherwise, he he could, United could have come under some real pressure to sell him in January because he was absolutely flying in the first kind of third of the season. Um, but now he's kind of back towards uh, full fitness again. You know, the rumor mill is starting, and it could be a tricky one for for Oxford in the summer. He he's likely to attract some interest from 
higher up if they don't get promoted. David Pritchard of the Oxford Mail with Matt then this week talking all things Ben Woodburn, of course, Carl Robinson as well. And interestingly, at the end there, Matt, a bit on Cameron Brannigan, who seems to be playing a re- real key role in this Oxford United side, who we do keep a bit of an eye on here on the Academy show because of the links with Robinson, with Woodburn and, of course, Brannigan. They've won five in a row now and sit third in League One. It's a good time for them. It certainly is, and and Brannigan, as you say, has been really instrumental for them for the last couple of seasons. He's been a a player that obviously we had our eyes on over the time he was coming up through Liverpool's academy, and he was one that that made appearances actually under Jurgen Klopp. I think you sort of forget that almost. He he played in the Europa League, I think, for for Liverpool at at some stage as well, and you know he's uh, he's always been a fantastic technical player and struggled a little bit with injuries when he was coming through. I think this season again he's had a couple of different knocks that have that have kept him out but you know he, he's such a, a talented player and he, he's one that always stood out when he was coming through the age groups and he's almost a, an example to to many of the, the players that are coming through Liverpool's academy we always praise where is you know where it's it's necessary to do so but also with that caveat of look all, all of these 18s 23s whatever not all of them are going to go and, and play regularly for Jurgen Klopp and his first team so you know, Cameron Brannigan was one that, that didn't quite make it at Liverpool, which I'm sure is, is well, it, it would have been his aim all the way through his, his sort of teenage years. But that's not to say that you can't go and have a real successful career and potentially make your way back up the leagues over the course of your career as well. No, we, we spoke before, obviously, about Neil Critchley and his first game for Blackpool being against Fleetwood. I, I remember watching Brannigan actually playing for, for Fleetwood during, I think it was time under Uwe Rosler. They reached the playoffs in League One in 2017, albeit three years later and now at the age of 23. He seems to be the real key man now at Oxford in the midfield, driving them forward. And David was even talking there of a, a club even as big as Leeds United, sort of looking at it and talking about how some of these players, and it goes across the board for all of the players we're going to talk about going forward in the 18s, the 23s. If they have to make that decision to step away from Liverpool, it will be a big decision for them to make. But there's no reason to say that they can't make their way back towards the top throughout the course of their career. Yeah, I think it was absolutely the the right move for for him to make it at the the right time as well. And obviously he's been out on loan a couple of times and, and didn't quite make it at, at first team level. But the fact that Leeds are interested and whether they still will be if if they end up going up into the Premier League, I don't know. But I would imagine it, it's highly likely that, that Cameron Brannigan will be a championship player next season. Whether that's with Oxford if they do get promoted or whether that's somebody else coming in for him, I'm sure, you know... It, you know, as, as David Pritchard said, it, he's at that level now where you think there's a good chance that a team, at least mid-table in, in the Championship, would take a look at him. And you know that's what it's all about for these players. It's it, it, Obviously, his dream one day is to be a Premier League player. And I have no doubt that he's got the ability to do that if he can stay injury-free. But it's a case of, of making these steps up, and whether that's with Oxford, whether that's a transfer over the summer, things are, are looking up for him and, you know, all of that hard work that, that's gone into his career so far is, is starting to pay off. Well, we spent a bit of time then talking about things in League One and away from Kirby and away from Anfield and what's going on with the academy. But let's now get right into the, the thick of the action here on the academy show. And let's check in on the under-18s who, since we last spoke, have been up on side against Middlesbrough and didn't have the, the greatest of visits up there. No, possibly the uh, the poorest performance of the season from the under-18s. Uncharacteristically, they, they got beat. They got beat 3-0 as well, so it was a, a fairly convincing result for, for Middlesbrough. And uh, Yeah, it, it could have been very different. Fidel O'Rourke missed a penalty when it was only 1-0. And, you know, at 1-1, suddenly the game can, can change and the, the tide can change in the match. But yeah, uh, generally, I think Middlesbrough, absolutely comfortable victors, absolutely deserved, absolutely no complaints. Surprisingly, that the Liverpool did get dominated in the way that they did. It's it's the first time they've really been genuinely poor. I think Barry Lutis's team this season. I think he'll be really disappointed with that. And uh, yeah, there was a, a couple of really nice goals from Middlesbrough in that, particularly the second one from uh, from Joe Gibson that I wanted to pick out. But um, yeah, generally a, a disappointing away day, and yeah, yeah, it's a long way to go to get beat. Yeah, it certainly is, but I suppose it's one of those character-building exercises for the under-18s who, last time we devoted so much time, of course, talking about that top-of-the-table clash with Manchester City, it's one of those where, as young players, they will learn very quickly that they don't let results fester and 
obviously then lead to another performance that doesn't go their way such as this. Yeah, I mean, we, we've even seen it with Liverpool's first team, of course, losing by the exact same scoreline to Watford, completely out of the blue. And it's just a case of having to bounce back and, and show a bit of character, as you say. So, as always with, with the under-18s, the, the, the buzzword, if you like, of this podcast is development. And that's what they've got to show. They've got to show that they can turn that around and, and not be affected by it and you know, have every faith that they'll, they'll be able to do that. Well, next up for us then is the under-23s. Time to uh, check in on them. And whilst they've not really been in action of late, there is some news out of the under-23s and it re- revolves around Tony Gallagher. It does. Uh, the left-back shortlisted for Premier League Two's Player of the Month award. And he must have played really well because, as you're going to tell us, he only played in two matches. He only played two games, yeah. Two full 90 minutes for, for Liverpool in February. Uh, first against Arsenal in that 3-0 win and, and Wolves the 2-1 win, which I think we, we talked about both of those games on, on the last show. So uh, we won't go into too much depth on those two games. But yeah, um, to be nominated for Player of the Month, I'm not quite sure how they work out who the nominees should be. Um, but yeah, fantastic for for Tony to to get that, and uh, yeah, hopefully he'll uh, he'll get the prize in the end. I mean, he is a player, obviously, who doesn't go through perhaps the most conventional of routes in the academy in terms of coming in as a youngster locally. Obviously, he was playing up in Scotland and brought to the club, and he's now one of those players. I'm sure he will look at this under 23s if he can get individual recognition it'll be great for him because he's got to be one of those who really is now wanting to sort of knock on the door for getting some kind of taste of first team football yeah definitely I think he was one who played against Aston Villa earlier in the season and uh, actually spoke to to one of the Blackpool reporters um, earlier this week and he was asking sort of which Liverpool academy prospects could move to to Blackpool along with Neil Critchley and and Tony was actually one of those that I picked out and sort of said you know he's he's at an age now where he's ready I think the the fact that he's picking up these accolades shows you know how how good he is and, and that sort of thing but he is he's on the verge of, of stepping up to that first team level I don't think that will be at Liverpool ultimately um, I don't think he's quite at that level but as we said you know dropping down and, and playing for someone else is, is a massive success as well and uh, yeah, he's been at Liverpool a couple of years now and, and impressed again another one who's had sporadic injuries that have not not been particularly lengthy always but uh, enough to keep him out of, of a sustained period of matches and I think best thing for, for him looking ahead to the summer would be to either to, to go out on loan maybe to a Blackpool or, or somewhere like that really establish himself as a, a top top um, senior player um, and yeah best of luck to him whatever he does I get the feeling we're going to have a lot of links with Liverpool players to, to loan moves to Blackpool over the next few months but we'll have to watch this space and see how many of those do actually come off but last word on Gallagher and being up for this award it's by no means a foregone conclusion five others up for the award as well as Tony Gallagher and one of those I know a player who really sort of took your eye during the FA Youth Cup last season Yeah Adrian Bernabe of, of Manchester City is, is one that stepped up from the under 18s to the under 23s this season and uh, yeah certainly one to watch out for I know Manchester City are, are not exactly best known apart from Phil Foden for, for producing young players who go into that first team obviously partly that's because of the, the level that their midfielders are at but uh, certainly this lad's Definitely, definitely got a chance. Still only 18, but he was absolutely superb against Liverpool last season. Obviously stepped up to the under-23s this season as well. And yeah, he's a a typical Spanish attacking midfielder. And uh, obviously Manchester City have got one of those leaving this summer. So certainly a a slot possibly could open up. But uh, yeah, I I would be surprised if he's not a name that we're talking about in the next two or three seasons. No, interesting. Certainly keep that one under the hat and see how he goes on. Well, we spoke right at the top about how this week's all about European football for the first team. Atletico Madrid to come in the Champions League, of course, in the last 16 second leg tie at Anfield. The uh, under 23s and under 19s have also had or will be in Europe youth action in Europe and or against European opposition and time now to look back on the under 19s who played in the UEFA Youth League against Benfica in Portugal unfortunately we couldn't get you out there for that one Matt but if you had gone you probably wouldn't have seen a result that you would have liked all too much anyway yeah I'm not sure our budget stretches to that <laughs> no. and uh, with coronavirus as well I'm not no sure true. I could have travelled so yeah. Uh, yeah probably a good job I didn't book my flights but uh, yeah a 4-1 defeat in the end against Benfica and uh, it was a, a real disappointment slightly unfortunate I think there was a couple of refereeing decisions that could quite easily have gone the other way but um, yeah Liverpool frustrated um, and out obviously it's only a, a one-legged tie so 
Liverpool don't have a, a second chance to turn that around. But yeah, a, a largely disappointing afternoon. Yeah, and I, I suppose difficult to really say if there were any standout performers or points of note really for, for Liverpool in this one. No, it, it's difficult. I mean, Harvey Elliott was there, um, but struggled to, to make a big impact. And I think the, the only reason that he was there actually was initially he was injured, I think, had a slight knock on, on Friday. So uh, looking ahead to the first team game with Chelsea, Liverpool and, and the first team decided that they would train as if he was going to be injured because they couldn't take the risk of, of him being back fit. As it turned out, he was actually back fit. But by that time, by the time they'd worked that out, it was too late for him to then be drafted into that Chelsea squad. So the best thing for, for him to do then was was to go with the under-19s and play our game, even though it wasn't senior football. A good experience for, for him to have. But uh, yeah, he could quite easily have been with the first team for Chelsea. But as it was, ended up going to Portugal and unfortunately couldn't pull Liverpool through. No, couldn't pull Liverpool through. And the task made even harder because of perhaps a bit of a, a lack of discipline from the young Reds because a couple of names are, are familiar on this podcast. Leighton Clarkson and Seth Vandenberg both unfortunately seeing red in this game. Yeah, um, two minimal challenges. European red cards, you might say. A, a little hit out from, from Leighton. Um, nothing much in it, I don't think. But uh, yeah, in European football, you, you do have to learn your lesson and, and you can't really do that sort of thing. And then... Sepp sent off uh, for pulling back Thiago Dantas. Um, just, you know, a, a silly silly challenge, really, that he didn't need to make. And look, it, it's one of those things that, as we always say, you've got to learn. Um, sometimes it takes a, a little error or a, a red card for you to realise that, that those things happen. And look, it, it wasn't Liverpool today. And certainly the, the two red cards were not the reason that they lost that game. They would have lost that game even if it was 11 v 11. But... Um, yeah, going forward, that's certainly something to, to learn from and, and make sure it doesn't happen again. What does it leave now, though, for this group of players? Obviously, as under-19s for the rest of the season because we see domestically under-18s and under-23s. This under-19s is a European model that is followed on the continent quite often, but it does see a bit of a mix of players, primarily in this game, obviously a number of the under-23s players actually young enough to be able to play in the under-19s. But as, a, as an under-19 age group, their season's over. But now, I suppose, looking ahead for what's to come for the under-23s. Yeah, uh, as you say, a, a complete mixture. I mean, there was a, a fantastic goal from Tyler Morton that he's one who's obviously stepped into the, the under-18s this season and we've we've picked him out on many an occasion for, for his, the talent and technical ability that he has. But um, yeah, for, for others like Leighton Clarkson or, or Vandenberg, it's all about, you know, how can they come back with the, the under-23s and, and potentially could play in, in Tuesday night's European game at, at, for against Wolfsburg in the Premier League International Cup for, for the under-23s. So certainly the, the season's not over. Obviously the, the under-18s still just about in that title race with Manchester City, so still got that to think about. But uh, yeah, for, for each of the, the players, they'll go back to either under-18s or, or under-23s football. And it's just a case of, of finishing the season strongly. It would have been a big thing to, to get through and to have more UEFA Youth League matches. But look, it, it wasn't to be. And... That word, development again, they're going to learn so much from, from this European campaign and, and hopefully a number of those players will still be involved next season when, when Liverpool, of course, the first team having already qualified for the Champions League for next season. So the under-19s will, will already be in that and, and be preparing for that for next year. Well, that's our reviewing done. Time now to, to get our previewing hats on and look ahead at, at what's to come for the Academy over the course of the next week. The Academy show will be back next Sunday as well here on the Blood Red channel. But in that time, there is a massive game for the under-23s. We've just spoken about the under-19s European game with Benfica, but Premier League International Cup quarter-final tie for the 23s against German side Wolfsburg, who have been going really strong in this competition. Yeah, uh, two real, real top quality sides. I think it's going to be a really good game and it's going to be interesting to see which Liverpool players play, obviously, with Atletico Madrid for, for the first team on Wednesday. So I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a second. But uh, yeah, so some interesting names that are already in the quarter or already in the semi-finals, I should say, if, if Liverpool progress in their quarter-final tie. Arsenal, uh, they beat Monaco. Um, I think that was possibly 3-2 or 4-3 uh, about a week ago. And then... Derby County, who've been doing fantastically well in the competition, might be a surprise name to some. They'll play West Ham. 
uh, and Swansea City against Benfica. That's the other quarter-final tie. Um, so yeah, Derby against West Ham is at the same time as the Liverpool game. The other one is uh, the day afterwards. So Liverpool will will find out in the not too distant future should they get through who they will play in the semi-final. And uh, yeah, it's a, an exciting time, of course. A quarter-final of uh, a European competition is is not to be sniffed at. Yeah, and for the 23s to say that they've not had great preparation for this game would probably be an understatement given the, the storms that we've been having. Last weekend's game with Blackburn Rovers was postponed due to the weather. And then obviously the, the news that Neil Critchley has gone to Blackpool leaves a number of these youngsters somewhat in limbo in preparation for arguably what we could define to this point as the biggest game of the season for them. Yeah, I think that would be a, a fair assessment. Certainly the long period between matches, it, it's going to be a couple of weeks since they last played as a group, certainly. Uh, I think a number of the, the players who played for the under-19s actually will step up to the, the 23s, so that will compensate a little bit for that. And uh, yeah, obviously with, with Neil Critchley having moved on, he's no longer there. Still no confirmation as, as we speak now as to who's going to take over, but uh, we understand it, it's going to be some sort of combination of, of the staff that, that Critch worked with when the under-23s were there. So there will be some familiarity for, for the players to work with. Um, whether Barry Lucas is, is there on the night, potentially Alex Inglethorpe as well could could be on the bench just for you know e- even more familiarity, if you like, and, and sort of continuity uh, between matches but uh, yeah it's it's going to be an interesting game I'm going to get down there so uh, if anybody is interested in, in following the, the result of that game I'm sure we'll have a live blog on the Echo website and, and my analysis and, and tweets etc will we'll all be on there And in terms of the game then in terms of who's going to play you mentioned obviously a, a fair number of those who played for the under 19s against Benfica but in, in throwing some names out there who are we expecting to play because I, I do know speaking to you in the office earlier that Cuevin Kelleher who has obviously been waiting for these chances to come up whether it be under 23s or first team unfortunately he's not going to make this one is he? No so he's been out injured which is uh as you say, a nightmare scenario, really. With with Allison's injury, it would have been the perfect time for, for him to get some time, at least on the bench, as a backup to Adrian. But uh, not to be, as as we seem to talk about a lot, really, with, with unfortunate timing with injuries with these young players. And, yeah, he would certainly have played, but uh, given his injury, he won't be involved. But plenty of, of other names that, that will be. I'm sure Harvey Elliott will be involved. Keanu Hoover, Jake Kane, Leighton Clarkson. Nico Williams as well, if, if he's not needed for the bench on Wednesday. And, and Curtis Jones is is maybe a, a sort of 50-50, whether he's on the bench for the Champions League or, or whether he plays here. Um, time will tell. It, it sort of depends on, obviously, other fitness issues for, for first-team players and who is is best suited to that game, whether Fabinho plays or, or starts on the bench, that kind of thing will, will dictate whether Curtis plays or, or not. And, uh, yeah, the, it's going to be... An interesting team on Tuesday night, which will give us a few hints as to what Jurgen Klopp is thinking for, for Wednesday at Anfield. Yeah, so even if it's not a case of you are really into the Premier League International Cup, if you want to, as you say, a hint to what Jurgen Klopp might do on Wednesday night for the Atletico Madrid side in terms of his team news, then keep an eye across what the under-23s are doing. Although, of course... The first team will be having their open training the day before, which we'll have on the Blood Red channel as well, which again might give some some more clues. So certainly there'll be plenty about. But before we go, we'll do our one to watch that we regularly do on the Academy show and pick out a name to, to look at. We're going really for a bit of a, a mismatch of a collection of things. There's not really any one to watch this time on the Academy show because we'll play our cards straight we were hoping there might have been a new under 23s boss named by today which we would then obviously discuss that so we'll go in first on that in a case of you've already said about how the existing staff will patch through for the time being do you think there's a likelihood we'll see that for the rest of the season or do you think the club will want to bring in a permanent replacement sooner rather than later yeah, it's certainly a possibility that that, that is the case, um, particularly if Liverpool were to go out on Tuesday night, the under-23s wouldn't have a, a massive amount to play for for the rest of this season. So that would possibly uh, make the importance of an appointment now a little less uh, pressing. But I think possibly the most likely scenario at this stage is that Barry Luter steps up from the under-18s to the under-23s. Um, I'm assuming that that's something that they will be considering 
Um, and then it would be a case of either looking for, for somebody else to take over from outside to take over the under 18s or promoting somebody from within. Um, but yeah, I think the, the fact that it came as such a shock, obviously the club will have known, um, a, well, not a massive amount before we did, to be fair. Um, but yeah, at, at the moment, there's no sort of provisions in place. I'd be surprised if, if that was the case by Tuesday, but you never know. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see who they go for, what they do. Um, obviously, two names that, that have been so, so instrumental for Liverpool over the, the last few years in, in Critchley and, and Barry Lutus. You'd be surprised if, if Barry wasn't under consideration at the very least. And I think he's probably the favourite at this stage. I thought you were going to say when you said two names there, looking through some of the, the betting for it, Josh Williams and David Hughes have both been mentioned, but you, you you steered clear of that one. Of course, the two guys who bring you the Analyzing Anfield podcasts weekly. But uh, in terms then of our, our one to watch, we'll get back to We've got three names that we're throwing at you this week. So we've spoken there about the new manager position and whether that may be an opportunity for Barry Lutus to move up as a number of his players have done from the under-18s. Second person we want to talk about, and... He's a player who is right at the top of the academy structure right now. He's, he is knocking on the door for the first team, and that's Curtis Jones. Now, we're not trying to obviously be wise after the event and say, look, Curtis Jones, this is a player we, we all knew about because he has already obviously not only played for the first team, he starred, he scored in a Merseyside derby. But the element here of what we're wanting to watch from the academy perspective is with Liverpool now three wins from securing the Premier League title, interesting to see how much of a part he might play in the remainder of the season, Matt. Certainly, yeah. And I mean, looking ahead to, to next season as well, you think with Adam Lallana moving on, uh, almost certainly in the summer, there's going to be a, a squad role there certainly to, to take hold of if Curtis can do that between now and the end of the season. And I think it's a, a massive period for him, really. I think as soon as the, the title is done, I think we're going to see a lot more of him, whether that's from the bench or from the start. I think that will depend on, on opponents and, and whether it's at Anfield or away from home and things like that. But you know, everything that we, we've seen from him so far would suggest that he's at that level and he's ready now. And look, it, it's an exciting time for, for the whole club, obviously, with Liverpool on the verge of, of ending that Premier League title drought. But I think he's one that the earlier Liverpool confirm this Premier League title, the better for him, because he's only going to get more and more opportunities. Um, obviously, as we said, potential for, for him to be on the bench for the Champions League on Wednesday. So he's not exactly a name that comes out of the blue, but I think it's going to be really interesting to sort of see how and where he fits in, whether that's in midfield, whether that's in the front three. It's going to be a, a little sort of test really for him to, to see where he's at ahead of, first of all, pre-season, but then next season as well, because I think I, I'm not the only one who, who fully expects him to be more and more prevalent as, as Liverpool play next season. And, and obviously after that as well, because... His talent, his ability, even at, at such a young age, he's ready now. And I think it would be a, a shame not to not to see him a few times between now and the end of the year. And I'm sure that's on the agenda. Yeah, and he's a 19-year-old who's obviously stepped up not in, only into captaining the 23s this year, but also in the first team. Remember, really first sort of glimpses of seeing him against Arsenal in the EFL Cup when he, he sort of seemed to play wide off the left, then move in field. Yet now more and more when he gets his chances, he's playing right in that central position, which shows the responsibility he wants to have, which we're seeing at Kirby every time he sort of seems to step out on the field of play. Yeah, definitely. And this season he's added goals to his game, which is always a massive, massively important thing. And you know, that, that's something that Adam Lallana has never really managed to do. Similar sort of players in terms of that, almost like a, a creative number eight, if you like. He's not quite a, a front three player, I don't think. I think his, his best position is certainly in the midfield. And if you can get goals and you can create and, and get numbers, but also have that responsibility and, and leadership and, and quality on the ball and, and that sort of thing. And just that maturity as well. He's not obviously massively experienced at first team level, but every time he gets an opportunity, he takes it with both hands. And he's just been, but he's been one that, that seems to have been around forever, but he's only, what is he, 18, 19 at, 19, at this stage. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's just such a, an exciting talent. And I'd be surprised if, if he's not in the squad more regularly next season, I'd be surprised if he's out on loan. Yeah, and it was, I think, it actually, it's a game that we missed sort of during the last episode in this one. The uh, game against Sunderland recently, and I think it's the, the Premier League Cup for the under-23s, eight minutes at the end of the game, 
and it, to me, watching the highlights of the hat trick he scored, it just shows the confidence he's playing with right now that he wanted the ball at every single time. And whilst the opposition were on the ropes and were already beaten, he showed no mercy. And I, I imagine that will actually have really impressed Jurgen Klopp and the likes of Vita Matos and those at the top end of the club. Yeah, 100%. That, w- that was a game that Liverpool needed to, to draw to get through in that competition to, to top the group they needed to, to win. But uh, yeah, 3-0 up on about 75, 80 minutes. Most players are just going to play the clock down, pass the ball about, but but not Curtis. He, he, he hadn't scored up until that point and he just wasn't having it. So he uh, <laughs> took the ball three times, dribbled past a few players and, and some really good finishes in there. Obviously, as we said, something that he's added to his game this season. But yeah, as you say, to, to take the game by the scruff of the neck when really there was there was absolutely no need to in terms of the context of it. But in terms of him sort of showing, look, I'm far too good for this level. Give me the ball, score three goals in eight minutes. And it's just a, another marker of, of his progression because I think 12, 18 months ago, he wouldn't have done that. But now he's got that confidence, arrogance almost to, to just say, look, we're three nil up, just give us the ball. I want a bit of this and you know the the result was there and it finishes 6-0 doesn't it so even better for for the the teammates as well that that, that was the case but certainly for him I think it's uh, something that, that won't have gone unnoticed at Melwood and as you say a man who's looking to progress right from captaining the under 23s into the first team which leads us nicely on to the third and final person we want to mention in this one to watch it's turned out to, to be three to watch but that being a man who Jones has succeeded in being Liverpool's under-23s captain. Not immediately, but Harry Wilson did have that role at one stage during his Liverpool career. And ahead of the Bournemouth game, he was with BT Sport, talking about his loan stay, obviously, at Bournemouth this season, was ineligible to play against Liverpool. And he does seem to be now at somewhat of a crossroads. Yeah, I thought actually he came across really, really well. For anyone who hasn't seen the, the BT Sports section, you can, can find that on YouTube after you finish watching us on here. And um, Nice one. <laughs> um, certainly, I thought the, the way he came across, the, the maturity, the the sort of... He, he didn't bat away any of the questions when it would have been quite easy to do so. I think uh, Jake Humphrey and Rio Ferdinand were, were asking him some some fairly straight questions of, yep. of where do you see yourself next year? And he was very, very clear in, in that he sees himself as a Liverpool player first and foremost. And you know, I, I said to you before, the night how he was he was sat in the press box at Anfield with his, his Liverpool coat on and you know, it, he's obviously desperate to, to be a Liverpool player and he's a Liverpool fan. He's he's been there for, for so long and you know, I think he deserves an opportunity, but again, just as, as last season was, pre-season is going to be massively important to him. It depends what, what Liverpool do in the, in the transfer market. It depends on the sorts of clubs that potentially will come in for him. Um, speaking to a, a Bournemouth Echo reporter last uh, week ahead of, of that Bournemouth game, he was sort of saying, well, look, Bournemouth, I'd love to keep him. And I think Steve Cook uh, has come out this yep. week and, and said, you know, look, he's a brilliant player. He's one of our best players. We'd love to keep him. But they've got to be realistic. And if Bournemouth go down, there's, there's absolutely no chance that, that Harry Wilson's going with them because he's a he's a Premier League player at yeah. the very least. Yeah, he's proven himself, as you say, to be at least a Premier League player, if not something better than that. And easy to forget that this is his first taste of that level. You mentioned he was holding his own with Jake Humphrey and Rio Ferdinand. The other two guys involved in that chat were Joe Cole and Peter Crouch, obviously two former Liverpool players. And Joe Cole made the point of in terms of, as we said right from the top, the buzzword development, in terms of development and bringing a player on, he has ticked every box that Liverpool would have asked. He went to Hull City, finished the season there, bagging goals for fun. He went to Derby last year and was arguably their best player on loan, obviously with the likes of Mason Mount and Fikayo Tomori, who have stepped in at Chelsea, absolutely fine. He's now gone to the Premier League and I think he's still Bournemouth's top scorer or certainly in and around that mark. So he must come back to Melwood or Kirby in the summer and say, am I now ready? I'm knocking on the door. I don't know what else you want from me because I've done everything I can. And Peter Crouch making the point that he's desperate to be a Liverpool player, as you say, obviously growing up being a Liverpool fan, but he's got to make that move for himself, whether it's time to move on permanently and whether he gets the timing right. Crouch referring to the fact that he went in the summer of 2010 and went to the the club and said, I need to move on for the better of my career. Six months later, Fernando Torres left. So you never know how these things are going to play out. 
No, and, and that's what makes it so difficult to predict. I think it's, it's such a, a difficult position that he's in. But as you say, in terms of, of what Liverpool have asked him to do, he's done everything right from the academy when he moved up from the, the 18s to the 23s. The challenge was you need to score more goals. So what did he do? The first season they told him that, well, he went and scored, I think, 31, 32 goals from, from a right-sided midfield position for the under-23s. Then it was a case of leadership, as we've talked about with, with Curtis Jones. It was a case of, well, OK, you've, you've done that. Now try and improve the, the players around you and make them better as well. Took the captaincy on and, and did that superbly. And then, as you say, he's gone out on loan to, to Hull, to Derby and, and now to Bournemouth. And he's continued and, and showed that it's not just at academy level that he can score goals. He can do that in the Championship. He can do that in the Premier League. And that's obviously a skill which you know any team in the world is, is looking for as many forward players who can, can stick the ball in the back of the net as possible. And when you think of, of Zerd and Shaqiri potentially moving on this summer, Diva Karigi as well, there is, there's going to be places there. It depends, obviously, what Liverpool do in the transfer market. We've spoken hundreds of times on, on different podcasts about the likes of, of Jaden Sancho, Timo Werner, players like that coming in. But I think Harry Wilson's got to be at the very least in that conversation. I think he'll he'll be desperately pushing that conversation because he's desperate to be a Liverpool player. But uh, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see what Liverpool do. If he does end up going on a permanent deal, which probably, if you push me at this stage, I think is probably the most likely scenario. Um I wouldn't be surprised to, to see him go to a Leicester or a Wolves or, or somewhere like that because I think he deserves a, a step up from Bournemouth but he also deserves regular football week in, week out and if a move like that was to come off for him Liverpool would definitely, definitely have a, at least a, a sell-on clause and a, a buyback clause in there as well and I think uh, there's a, a story on our website at the moment about Luis Alberto being valued at 60, 70 million now by uh, by Lazio over in Syria, A. And uh, if he moves on, Liverpool get 30% of, of that fee. So they've certainly you know, learned lessons from the past and, and that will be inserted into the clause. But yeah, it, whatever happens with, with Harry Wilson, Liverpool are, are going to benefit in some way because he's obviously a huge academy prospect. He's gone and, and proven himself now at first team level. And at the very, very least, Liverpool will either make a, a huge amount of money from him or they'll just set the example for, for the next group of players to say, look, we've produced this lad. He's gone on now to play for, for Premier League sides week in, week out. And, and why can't you be the same? Yeah, very interesting. He certainly is at that, that crossroads. And if he comes back to Liverpool... I'm with you, Matt, I think he could more than hold his own in the Liverpool squad. It is just that question of how much game time he will want. But we'll have to keep our eyes fixated on that one as it plays out through the summer. But before we leave you, as we always do here on the Academy show, we'll point you towards the next uh, amount of games before we are back with you next Sunday. And the next game is coming up for both the 18s and 23s before what will be a triple header of Merseyside derbies on the Saturday, Sunday and Monday, lest we forget the first team at Goodison Park on the Monday night football uh, next week, is obviously Liverpool under-18s and 23s also playing the Toffees. Yeah, it's a big, big week. Obviously, as we've spoken about already, Wolfsburg on Tuesday, but then the under-18s at Kirby on Saturday. I think that's an 11am kickoff. And then the under 23s away at uh, at Everton. That's at Southport at 1 p.m. on Sunday. So, yeah, I will be there for for both of those games. I'll be there on Tuesday night as well, providing analysis, updates, and and hopefully speaking to certainly Barry Lutus, Neil Critchley, no more, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a, a big week, and, and hopefully the Reds can can get a couple of wins in those matches. If you still want your chats with uh, Neil Critchley, you can just go up to to Blackpool, enjoy yourself by the uh, seaside perhaps once or twice but anyway that's it from us here this week on the Academy Show of course we will be back with you next Sunday uh, obviously reacting and talking about those Merseyside derbies there'll be plenty of coverage on the Liverpool Echo web website as always until next time if you want to leave us any comments on the YouTube page in the uh, comments section any questions you've got for Matt any players that you want to keep an eye on any news or views you want just let us know here on the youtube page for those listening to the podcast thanks as always for your continued loyalty wherever you do get your audio on demand but until next time from blood red it's bye for now 